Hey, this is Mungunzo with Flipping the Switch, and today we're going to talk about Metroid Prime Remastered. Now, through the act of curiosity, we're all explorers. Yet when one ponders the meaning of that word, our imaginations often conjure a certain image. The traveler trekking through an unknown land, the spelunker delving into the depths of a cavern, or an astronaut flying high into the vastness of space come to mind. But there are other, more mundane methods of exploration. The person reading a philosophy text to learn about a new way of examining and interpreting the world around you. The worker learning a new skill. The player who is trying out a new format for the first time. Exploration occurs when one ventures out into new territory that they have not been in prior. And often can be a collaborative experience whenever the creative fields are concerned. As every new book, movie, or game is a new experience, not only for the authors, but for the consumer who will also go on their own journey within that work. So what would happen if Retro, an American studio with no experience with the franchise in question, set out with a mission to transition this 2D property into the third dimension? How would fans of said franchise respond to being in this uncharted territory? The result of this shared exploratory endeavor was Metroid Prime for the GameCube, long considered one of the system's greatest games and recently remastered by Retro for the Nintendo Switch. A stellar first-party shooter on a system that needs as many quality entries into this genre as it can get. It's a game that puts you in the helmet of one of Nintendo's most legendary heroes, consistently piquing your interest and curiosity. And in doing so, it makes you into an explorer, not only of this vibrant new world, but also of what it even means to be a Metroid gamer. As someone who had an NES on my first system, I'm sad to report that I never had this series growing up. Same can be said for Super Metroid on the Super Nintendo, though I did enjoy playing it at my best friend's house. And I never played any of the portable games, with the exception of Metroid 2. And though I enjoyed the games, I could hardly be considered a fan. After the SNES, my gaming shifted mainly to PC, um, and though my sister had a GameCube, I played exactly two games for it. One was Resident Evil 4, the other was the original Metroid Prime. And I remember being intrigued, but was ultimately turned off by the bizarre GameCube controls, and I never finished it. Time passed, and with the Wii and its virtual console, I discovered a whole new world of games. I became an explorer myself, and one of the franchises I spent the most time with was Metroid. Now, later I would play Metroid Prime 3, still one of my favorite first-person shooters of all time, and Metroid Other M, a game that enraged me in ways I still can't describe, killed the franchise, and was instrumental in souring me on Nintendo for an entire generation. Now, next came the announcement that there would be no unified account system for their next system. And to me, this sealed the deal for me not only on no longer being a Nintendo customer into the next generation, but also on ever trusting digital game sales again. With the Nintendo Switch came the return of carts on a console. And with the system emphasizing physical media at a time when the rest of the, the industry was sprinting in the other direction, I was intrigued by it. What I was not prepared for was the devastation that Other M wrought, especially after that, was the absolute love bomb the system would become to Metroid. Dread being my favorite game in the series, period, and Prime releasing as a full remaster. Now, I put that in parentheses as this honestly appeared to be more than a complete remake. It looked so good. And though I could not get in on the first shipment because the game sold out immediately, I paid my $40 to GameStop online and was thrilled to get the game a few weeks later. I suited up and responded to a nearby distress call. Now, your adventurous Samus begins with your arrival in a derelict space pirate science vessel orbiting the planet of Talon IV. After fighting her way through the remnants of the pirate's forces and the critters being studied, events inevitably lead to Samus falling in a ditch, as usual, and losing all of her suit's functionality before heading to the planet below to further investigate the space pirate's interests in the system. As the adventure continues and Samus comes to realize what is truly at stake, priorities are going to shift, leading to an adventure that builds an urgency as more discoveries are made. 
it all plays out organically and doesn't get in your way if you just want to shoot things in the face. And that's because, with few exceptions, this game story is delivered via environmental storytelling or in lore found by investigating the area. Talon 4 is a world that lets you feel its age, with layers of civilization to uncover, from ancient ruins and temples of the Chozo to the labs and mines of the newly arrived space pirates, it's often possible to discern what is happening just by minding your surroundings. Now, scanning the various critters, enemies, lab terminals, and ancient um, writings strewn throughout the planet is also going to enable you to feel the daily going-ons and motivations of its inhabitants, both past and present, as well as gather data on how to best deal with any threats present. Scanning is also the means by which the game provides hints and tips for what needs to be done in order to overcome obstacles or navigate the maze-like environments of Talon 4 successfully. Samus' suit not only um, is uh, shy about pinpointing the energy spikes detected, but what this does is it often leads you to where you need to go next, minimizing any potential frustrations that would otherwise come from wasting time being in the wrong place. Now, it's a good thing because Prime is the most linear experience I have yet to play in this franchise, despite its illusion of openness. Numerous attempts at sequence breaking led me to a feeling that I was never able to do anything out of order in this game. Now, that isn't to say that there are not rewards for returning to areas earlier than intended, most often in the form of an energy tank or missional uh, expansion, and sometimes even something more substantial but I won't get into that because of spoilers. But more often than not, you'll just hit a dead end with no way to move forward. Naturally, this was more than a bit jarring as someone used to a more freeform adventure in these sorts of games. Samus moves better than I ever would have imagined in 3D, and I adored the new Switch controls personally. Having twin sticks means that we finally have the precision in both the platforming and the gunning that this game badly needed in my mind. And it all feels like a dream come true to me. Enemy variety is also a plus, though until I reached the phase on mines, I did feel that the game had a noticeable lack of difficulty that was again clashing with my definition of Metroid in similar ways to the lack of sequence break. Bosses in particular, while serving as great set pieces, were mind-numbingly boring to me, with more waiting than action, an issue only corrected once again in the later game. Now, later on, there's some absolutely fantastic boss encounters, and again, I won't spoil here, but the early game is very lacking in that. Linearity aside, it's standard Metroid fare. You're going to explore the planet to retrieve your lost suit functionality as you gradually work your way through the maze and exterminate the hostile denizens of Talon 4. Metroid is honestly a perfect vehicle for the first-person shooter genre, and the adventure proceeds and your arsenal grows retro- begins to layer in additional combat tactics to render once challenging enemies trivial. Different visors can be used to see enemy weak points, for example. Shields can be stripped or stunned with a wave beam or even frozen in place with an ice beam. Using various projectiles to unlock doors and the visors to locate secrets in the area also means that there's also a wonderful synergy between the exploration and the combat elements. Now, despite The fact that they call this a remake, this honestly looks and feels like it was built from the ground up for Nintendo Switch. Lighting and textures have received an incredible upgrade, and the areas you'll go to go a long way in making you feel like a lone explorer of some recently discovered planet. The first time I saw the rain effects or witnessed the reflection of Samus in her visor after firing a charge shot in a dark place genuinely impressed me. Areas are vibrant and colorful and stand out from one another if a bit Nintendo basic in its use of elemental themes. Animations are also on point, with particular praise for the times you will go into a morph ball, which both looks and feels superb. Now, the soundscapes in this game are equally impressive, with some of the best music of its era receiving a wonderful overhaul. The first time you step out into the Fendrana Drifts and hear that soundtrack kick in as you explore this icy wonderland, it's a moment of triumph for audiovisual teamwork. Music also transitions effectively from the evocative music of exploration to the more strident songs of combat whenever more pressing threats emerge as well. Sound effects are also well done, from the blaster fire and missiles to the sounds of the local flora and fauna. I personally encounter no glitches of either the audio or video variety in my playthrough. 
impressive when you think of all the camera transitions from first to third person when you use the morph ball or change bag. Now, in terms of things I didn't like that stand out, one thing has to be mentioned. Near the end of the game, you're going to have to conclude a scavenger hunt for 12 MacGuffins beyond the suit upgrades needed to finish the game in general. Now, to me, this was completely unnecessary padding that did not respect my time and only served to prolong the game past when I would have chosen to end it. It's an opportunity that I feel was missed in terms of trimming this out entirely, or at the very least, lessening the requirements to access the end game. As of this writing, the game is still $40 new, and I don't see that changing anytime soon as it's a first-party Nintendo title. And as it stands, it's a steal anyway. And I would have easily paid more if I had to in order to experience this game. So don't let the $40 stop you for absolutely no. Metroid Prime overall was a pleasant surprise in the Switch's sunset years as I ever could have asked for. Part of the strength of the Nintendo Switch's library is its clever curation of past games to match the stellar current first-party efforts. And in updating one of the GameCube's best, they took an easy win. To me, Metroid should serve as the game that Nintendo can point to when they are called Kitty. The Defender 2 cabinet, if you will, in the corner of the arcade. The game may not move as many units as Mario, yet it still performs an important and essential function, as that tough as nails experience that will test the metal of gaming enthusiasts. Now, one thing I will say is Metroid Prime is not that game. A product of a time when Nintendo badly needed an answer to Halo and was also very keen to skin their legacy IPs and stuff new gameplay into them, Metroid Prime was uncharted territory that could have ended badly as so many GameCube efforts ultimately did. But something about this expedition into the unknown worked out wonderfully for Retro and for Nintendo. And despite my hang-ups on what constitutes a Metroid game, I found myself having a great deal of fun with this one. Because games are adventures for us as much as for their developers, and exploring this interesting side story of Samus and the Space Pirates, I feel like an explorer, far more ready to take a chance on a new experience than I might have before this game. And anyone who knows me will understand just how high a praise that is. Hey, if you've listened this far, I want to once again thank you for coming along with another adventure through my backlog with me. Always appreciate any comments or suggestions below. Um, there's going to be some exciting changes coming the next after the next few reviews are published. And I'm excited to kind of talk about that once the time comes. But um, I'm actually very excited for where we're going with this. and. Honestly, this is making a difference. These 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 videos, audio, whatever you want to call them, are really making a difference in spurring me to get through that backlog. And it, it feels like I'm actually making progress in it, where before I was embarked on this project, this endeavor, I didn't feel like the progress was coming easily. So, again, you have my thanks for that, the people who listened all the way through this, or even if you didn't. Um, any attention, I understand, especially given how many videos is on this platform and how precious your time is. Um, the fact that you would give me even a modicum of it is it, it speaks, it, it humbles me greatly. So thanks so much for coming along. And if there's any other first person shooters you'd like to see covered on the switch outside of this and crisis, which I also did earlier, um, definitely leave a comment below. Let me know what you'd like to see. And um, I might check it out. I'm always looking for more things to play. Not that I need it. But as always, I hope you guys had a great weekend. I hope you're doing great wherever you're at, and I hope you continue to game on. Thanks.